Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum's monthly lecture series. My name is Angie Grove. I'm the executive director at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And before we get an introduction to today's program, I have a few remarks about the museum. Uh, we are a community nonprofit museum, and we bring this lecture series to you as part of our larger community enrichment program, which is sponsored by some of our community partners. So I'm going to pull those up right here. So I'd like to thank our community partners at North Country Community Credit Union, M&T Bank, AARP Vermont, and Town Meeting TV. Town Meeting TV records this program and puts it on their TV channel, as well as allows us to put it on our YouTube channel so it can reach more people. So thank you to our community sponsors for this and all of our community enrichment programs. Second up, I want to tell you about some upcoming events at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Our uh, lecture series continues in April, on April 21st. Um, we, we will have uh, Rob Grandchamp, who will be talking about the history of Masons in Vermont. If you are a regular attendee of our program, you might have heard Rob Grandchamp speak last October and he spoke about the Civil War and he um, went off of no cards, no presentation and was engaging for the whole time. So he's a great speaker and he'll be coming back April 21st for our next month's program. We also have coming up our spring book club is meeting on May 5th at three o'clock. And the book club right now is reading The Fork, sure. Bernard Cornwell. This is a historic fiction novel and is steeped in primary source research. And it is all about a Revolutionary War battle that happened up in what is now Maine, um, and uh, which is you know part of the greater New England. So a lot of similarities to what was going on in Vermont as well. Anyone is allowed to join us for the book club, whether you've read the book or not. And this is just casual conversation amongst people um, about books, about history over tea and cookies. So that's at the museum on Sunday, May 5th. The last thing about the museum I'd like to mention is that we are gearing up for our 2024 season. So we are in need of volunteers. We have lots of different projects you can get involved in if you're interested in volunteering. We have volunteers work the museum at the front desk, give tours. We have an archeology span team of volunteers who are sorting artifacts. We need educators for field trips. And we also have some historical research and some digitization projects going. So if you have any time that you're looking to give it back to the community and you might be interested in one of these projects, please email me at ethanallenhomestead at gmail.com. And I can tell you more about the projects and send in the volunteer application to you. Okay, the lastly is not with the Homestead Museum, but with one of the organizations that we sometimes partner with since it's very much related to today's program, I thought this audience might be interested in the Bridging Perspectives series, which is with the Abenaki Artists Association here in Vermont. Um, we've partnered with them on other programs and their director Vera has given a, our lecture uh, last year in January as well. So they have this upcoming series um, and the one that's coming up right around this one is March 21st intergenerational trauma, healing, and resilience. And like our monthly lecture series, their programs are also being recorded. So you can also catch them after the fact as well. That's with the Abenaki Artists Association. Now, I just really quickly wanna talk about what my role is gonna be in tonight's program or this afternoon's program. Uh, I'm gonna act as the facilitator watching the chat box. And then at the end of the program, I will also then be facilitating the Q&A session with Joe, um, helping call on hands and uh, calling on questions in the chat box. So if you have any questions, please save them to the end. Um, but if you do put a question into the chat box in the middle of the presentation, we will get to it at the end of the program as well. So you can type it in there if you're afraid you're going to forget it. That's fine. So now I am gonna step down and I'll come back at the end of the program to help with Q&A. And I'm going to introduce uh, the man who is then gonna introduce our speaker. 
So I'd like to introduce uh, Glenn Fay. Glenn Fay is a board member here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. He also is independently a historian, an author, a researcher, and an all around great guy. And he um, has, I believe, um, seen programs by Joe before that he might tell us a little bit more about. And um, it was Glenn who caught, caught our, turned our eye to Joe. So thank you, Glenn, and take it away. Thank you, Angie. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joseph Bruchak today. Joe was raised in the Adirondack foothills town of Greenfield Center by his maternal grandparents. He's the founder of the Greenfield Review Press, which has published over 150 multicultural books and anthologies of contemporary poetry and fiction. Joe has earned his BA from Cornell University, master's from Syracuse, and his PhD in comparative literature from the Union Institute and was named the 2023-2025 Poet Laureate of Saratoga Springs, New York. Joe Bruchak is a citizen and honored elder of the Nalhegan Band of the Kusak Abenaki Nation. Joe, Joe can be seen with his son in the new PBS documentary, Monadnock, The Mountain That Stands Alone, hosted on the website joebruchak.com. Our Songs Remember is a combination lecture and performance focusing on the ways in which the Abenaki oral traditions of storytelling and music play a part in the preservation of our indigenous ways. Incorporating, and I'm gonna butcher this, Joe, uh, Park Holligan, the drum, and Pabacongan, the flute, Joseph will take us on a journey to the enduring roots of the Western Abenaki nations, showing how songs carry the heart and meaning of this enduring Native American culture. Both English and Abenaki language will be heard throughout the presentation, and several stories will be told that exemplify the way oral tradition was has always served at least two purposes, to entertain and to instruct. I've seen Joe perform and I was left with the realization that this gifted man brings people together, and we need more of that. Let's have a listen. Joe, you're on. Like why he don't back? The ways he shows up, I don't know if that was it. My name is Joseph for the peaceful one. In Dai Saratogi, I don't know if he's on Beak, I'm over an area called Saratoga, or the Medicine Spring Place. I don't know Ba Nia, a human being, one who stands up and tries to do right, is what I am. Takiak, I hope so, are all of you. Of our old tradition is one of the ones that I'm very fond of, is the way to open a gathering with the sound of the drum. For the drum is the heartbeat. And that heartbeat is always held within us. That song of the heart is always being played, although sometimes we do not listen to it. And this song is one that would be used in a very simple way. When we traveled by the old superhighways of the rivers and the lakes, we came to a community that was not our own. We would politely ask permission to land our canoes by singing a song from the water. And those on land could respond with a song welcoming us. I should say that my son, Jesse, who speaks the Abenaki language quite fluently and runs our um, Abenaki language programs, both at our center and at uh, the University of Middlebury, first heard this song when he was four years old. <laughs> it was being sung as a Passamaquoddy welcome to those of us coming from other nations to Passamaquoddy ceremonial days in Pleasant Point, Maine. So this song. Yo gano de yo gano na Yo gano de yo gano na Ay yo ani he ay yo kyo he Ay yo ani he ay yo kyo he 
Kaiwani hey a yukyo he, Kaiwani hey a yukyo he, Yuguano de Yuguano da, Yuguano de Yuguano da, Kaiwani hey a yukyo he, Kaiwani hey a yukyo he, Kaiwani hey a yukyo he, Kaiwani hey a yukyo he. Guano de, guano de, guano de, guano dani. Guano de, guano de, guano de, guano dani. Guano de, guano de, he, guano de, guano de, he, guano de, guano dani. Guano de, guano dani. So I hope that I am welcome, and that I have landed my canoe in a good way. By the way, I want to point out my drum. On this drum, it has four circles, one in each of the four quadrants, standing for the four directions, standing for the four ancestors of grandmothers too, and grandfathers too, and also a teaching that was given me many years ago by Harold Tantaquidgen of the Mohegan Nation. He had this design across with those four dots in it on the wall of the Tantaquidgen Indian Museum. And he told me that the first one stands for the first step we all need to take to listen. We must always listen with both ears. Remember, we have one mouth and two ears, so listen at least twice as much as you talk. And then the second step is to observe, to look closely, and make sure we know what we're seeing before we begin to speak about it. The third is part of what this story is about, part of what this day is about, this presentation, to remember. One of the most powerful things we can do is remember, and by hearing and seeing, that memory becomes clear. And then the last is to share, which keeps that circle going around. So listen, observe, remember, and share. Memory is a powerful thing. Our song is remember. That is what I've called this particular presentation. And <clears throat> quite frankly, is simply true that songs remember in our indigenous tradition, songs are not just words and music performed by people. Songs are living beings. They're aware. They have existence beyond us as well as within us. Song is one of the most essential things that makes us human beings before we were human. So therefore, think of the song as a gift from creation that we must listen to carefully to understand. I'm actually going to not just look at our Abenaki traditions, but also draw in a few things from other places I've been and other people I've known. And one person I want to mention right now is a dear friend of mine, Kevin Lock, Tokea Inajin, the first to arise, his Lakota name. Kevin walked on in 2022, but his songs and his stories are still with us. He was a great flute player and a hoop dancer. And he told me a story that I've never forgotten. By the way, Kevin and I were performing together at the first International British Storytelling Festival in 1989. And we were taken to a place called Avebury Village, an ancient site, a site from thousands of years ago. And the first thing we did when we were there was to blow the eagle bone whistle to all the directions. And we heard on the wind coming to us a song. Kevin told me that many years ago, he was performing at the Meskwaki settlement. By the way, the Meskwaki nation in Iowa, ourselves, a native nation in the state of Iowa, is not on a reservation. It is actually privately owned land by people that have been moved many times, including near the St. Lawrence Valley decided they would not leave Ohio, Iowa. And so they sold their horse herd and bought 70 acres. That was their personal land. That is where the settlement is. And today the settlement is 7,000 acres and the Squawky people are still there. By the way, if you know any of Beneke, you'll hear the key at the end of their name, which indicates they're Algonquin speakers like our Beneke people. For K-I means this earth and the Squawky means red earth people. Well, before his performance that evening, Kevin walked out into the fields there in Tama, Iowa, where the Meskwaki settlement is located by, and 
he listened and he began to hear a song. And he took his flute and began to play that song that he heard, thinking he'd been given a new song and feeling really blessed by it. So that evening at his performance, he told that story, played that song. And then afterwards, an elder came up to him and said, oh, I am so glad you played that old song of ours. I have not heard it for 40 years. You see, the wind had remembered, the song had remembered itself. So too, it was giving itself back again. You know, when I was living in, in West Africa between 1966 and 1969, the power of song was made clear to me on a daily basis. Songs were in every aspect of life, whether it was weaving cloth or pulling the nets full of fish from the Gulf of Guinea, or in the funerals that were as strong as the throbbing of the drums at night and voices were lifted. You know, one of the saddest things about the Western world, for example, our state of Vermont, is that all too often the small white world was afraid of the power of traditional music. Drums were banned in so many places, including here. It was uh, actually several decades ago when the drum was finally returned to both the Abenaki people of Vermont and also the two reserves of Wolanak and Odenak in Canada. At the same time, those drums were returned. My, my son Jesse was part of the forming of the drum groups in both of those communities. Homer St. Francis, who was then the chief of the Missisquoi band, uh, then called the, uh, uh, a slightly different name, <laughs> uh, so St. Francis Sokoki, because Sokoki is one of our original native people who made up what became called Abenaki, which is a conglomeration of a number of different Algonquin speaking nations, all related cousins to each other pushed and changed in their location by the forces of colonialism, especially British colonialism. In any event, what Homer said to me was, he remembered when he was a young man, if anybody in the town of Swanton, any of the native people played a drum, within five minutes, the state police were at their door, breaking it up and confiscating the drum. The same thing happened in Canada, the two reserves, which were made up of refugees from New England. At those reserves, if you played a drum, the Catholic priest would quickly show up and take the drum and stop the gathering. So what they learned to do there at Odenak was to uh, use the rattle, because when you use a rattle, a rattle cannot be heard outside of your house where the song and the dance are taking place. And also a rattle can just be shoved into your shirt when someone shows up who shouldn't be there and then you can take it out again after they leave. And to make it even more interesting, what would happen is that at these gatherings, if they had someone outside watching for the priest and they saw the priest coming, they warned the people inside and immediately the uh, fiddles would be pulled out. And by the time the priest arrived, they were all playing the fiddle and square dancing. By the way, there is a song that remembers that, which I heard performed one year when my family and I were actually performing at part of the uh, summer um, celebration at Odenak. And that song, which is done with the rattle and incorporates the dance, sounds like this. If any of you are fiddle players, you recognize that as Turkey in the Straw, one way in which subverting the traditional of the European becomes a way of maintaining the traditional of the indigenous. When I lived in West Africa, one of the greatest composers of songs in Ghana was an illiterate, I use that word illiterate because he was certainly literate, a song maker named Akpalu. And when I wanted to encourage my students to recognize the importance of poetry, that it was part of the had down some of his songs, which were and their power, their poetry was so powerful, eloquent. I've never forgotten many of those songs in translation as well as in a. One of the things Akpalu said to me when I visited him and met him was that the songs come to me in the night and they will not let me sleep. Those songs would wake him up and demand that he listen to them and remember them so that he could sing them. I have to say, I'm familiar with that experience. I have to give in often in the middle of the night to get up and write what has come to me or try my best not to think of music or poetry before I close my eyes. When song is there, 
waiting for you. Your life is different. Songs are often critical or satirical, or they may say something which someone doesn't want to hear. And by the way, Akpalu told me a story about that. He wrote a particular song that was critical of the local government and the local government of the town banned the song. But one day as he was walking through the market, he heard that song being sung by a man from the Hausa tribe, a person from a different language group who did not speak the other language yet was singing that song. And that delighted the old song maker so much that he decided that he would write this song about it, that even law cannot stop the power of a song. As I've traveled, I've seen this happen in many different ways. And I've also seen people saying that something is dead and gone. That's often been said about our culture, our traditions, our languages, our songs, our past. In fact, uh, they will never come in yet. 1992, I traveled to the part of Nunavut, uh, the Canadian territory that was ceded as partially self-governed by the Inuit people in the late 20th century. I was there as part of a film project looking at ways in which the indigenous traditions and prophecies had great meaning to a modern world where ecological devastation was threatening all life and still is. While on Baffin Island, I was told by my Inuit hosts that I could not hear drumming because it had been totally forbidden by the Anglican church. In fact, they told me there was only one drum on that entire huge island. So I heard and recorded stories from the elders, but did not hear one traditional song being sung. Let's fast forward 30 years and search the internet today. We'll find in 2024 recordings of contemporary Baffin Island Inuit people performing traditional songs on the drum, including one lovely clip in which you can see a small boy with his own huge frame drum playing and singing next to the elder who sings that along with him. You know, the story of colonization of the Americas and colonization of what we now call Vermont on um, Dakina, our land, is one of constant dislocation and the attempt to dissolution of indigenous people. It's a story till, still being told to this day by colonial voices in many ways. And one of the things those voices constantly say is, stop beating that drum. Stop singing those songs. Native music, although it's been distorted and misrepresented, is ominous to the majority culture sometimes. Of course, often the only things that they expected us to do were war dances, usually something we made up on the spot or which was not traditional. And they had created in the movies in Hollywood, a certain drum beat, which unfortunately we can still hear sometimes being uh, being imitated at uh, football games. Boom, 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 boom. But if you see people performing, oh, I should mention one other thing, which is kind of cool. Living up to or down to majority cultures' expectations has long been a part of indigenous life, especially in the 20th century. In Swanton, for example, decades ago, one of the ways that local Abenaki artists could sell their work was by coming to the train station early in the morning, wearing everyday clothing like that of a typical rural Vermonter of that period, bringing along their craft work in several bags. And before the train arrived, taking out from those bags, stereotypical Indian clothing, complete with tall feathered headdresses. So they would look real when they sold their artwork to the white passengers. In fact, the Western style headdresses were worn by prominent male leaders in every Native American nation until the last part of the 20th century when more traditional head coverings began to reappear, which you can see on our elders and our leaders today in Vermont, the new old way of showing your indigenous connection. And uh, I should point out too, an interesting thing about uh, those headdresses is that they were almost always made of eagle feathers, but they were found primarily in that particular form along the tribes of the Great Plains, not here in the Northeast. And the idea of the honor of carrying the feathers of the birds on your head ties into another level of song. The idea that songs were given to us by the birds, that the songs that we hear can come from the wind and the birds. Now, there's a little problem with audio, so if I play this flute, I'm sure that... It may be a little bit distorted, so I'll not do much of that. But I will say that the story of the flute is a story of music and memory. The flute, which we call 
Pekong God, the hollow object you blow through, Pekong God. The food we was given to us by the trees and by the first that came to be, Pecker made holes in the hollow branch of the cedar tree that was broken off on the end. When the wind blew across it, it made a sweet sound. Now there was a young man who had not been able to think of any way he could tell this one young woman how he felt about her. So his grandmother said, go into Kitsikapiwi, the big forest, and listen, and then you may hear an answer to what you need. And he heard, when he was asleep, a whistling sound, a pretty sound. When he woke up, that sound was still there. He looked up and saw a woodpecker on the branch of a tree, a hollow tree branch, a cedar tree branch. And when you your cross, it was making that sound, changing as the bird hopped from one spot to another. And he realized that was a gift being given him. That song was given him by the tree, by the bird, and by the wind. And so taking that branch from the tree, the first flute somehow was fashioned. And then he began to practice because he knew that even though he couldn't speak, he could still breathe a little bit when he saw that young woman. And he made up a song for her. He played it for her one night as she was in her lodge with her parents. And hearing that song, somehow she knew who it was and went outside as he stood there in the moonlight asked if that song was for her. And he managed to say, uh-huh. They got to know each other. They married. And then when they married, that song became hers. It was like giving an engagement ring. But one big difference, because when that song became hers, no longer was it played on the flute. Instead, she composed words for it and turned it into a lullaby. A lullaby played to the sound of the rattle. And one of the interesting things about contemporary native music, or actually traditional native music now, is that the oldest recorded songs on wax cylinders were recorded on or of lullabies, Native American lullabies. And about 25 years ago, my son Jesse and a group of uh, other people from indigenous nations of the Northeast were invited to the American Philosophical Society. The American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia has quite a collection of indigenous materials, including a lot of these recordings, but they didn't know what the recordings were, where they came from, or what they were about. And in listening to them, Jesse and the other people who were from Algonquin nations said, no, no, those are lullabies. And one of them, the Penobscot lullaby, is from our people. And so copies of those songs were recorded and repatriated back to the Penobscot nation, a song that had remembered itself even through the medium of a wax cylinder recording. So that idea of memory and song can incorporate contemporary things as well. I remember Maurice Dennis, Madawi Lassus, an elder who lived in Old Forge, New York, telling me how when he was a young man, he took a tape recorder and went from one elder to another, all around New England, gathering their stories, hearing their songs and recording them so they would not be forgotten. But the, our human memory is really important. I remember Marisa saying to me, Joseph, I want you to listen well and remember what I tell you because one day my children who are not listening to me may come to you and ask you to tell them the stories I shared with you. Thinking a story and song, I also think of language. I think, for example, of my dear friend, Jeannie Brick, uh, an honored basket maker, a language keeper, a person who for generations here in Vermont taught many other indigenous people those skills and those ways, including dances and basket mating, making they had not uh, kept perhaps in their families as they once had. And she told me a story and it has a song connected to it. The story is that long ago, in the 18th century, when the then community of Odenak was attacked by Rogers Rangers, the people ran for shelter across the river, not realizing that the one little girl was left behind. Her name was Molly Ann. When they realized she'd been left behind, someone went back to get her. And as she came close to the building where she was, and by the way, in those years, in the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s, many of our indigenous people did not live in wigwams. They lived in frame houses, just like their neighbors who were European. And he could hear her singing a song that she just made up at that moment about how lonely she was and how she had no one as a friend to help her. 
of course, she was then taken and rescued and survived. And that song was passed on down. I'm not going to sing it to you because it is a Jeannie Brinks family song. But I will say that uh, my friend uh, Rajan Obamsu, and I've got a link on here, by the way, to one of his songs, an honored elder and spiritual leader also told me that story and that it was remaining as um, it was told in the Abenaki language, which brings me to Cecile Wawanonet. Cecile, a teacher of the language who passed away a couple of decades ago, she and her son Eli worked with my son Jesse in teaching and learning the Abenaki language so that others would not forget. By the way, Abenaki is how we say it when we're speaking Abenaki, Abenaki is the way it's spoken in sort of the English way. So I'm using both terms here, so you'll know neither one is wrong. But uh, one of the things that Jesse quickly discovered with the language is that one of the best ways to teach a language is through music. Music helps you remember. So instead of just saying, um, say, thank you, Olioni, very good. Say, thank you, now say you're welcome. And Dakagui, don't mention it. Very good. Now say Olioni. Now say Dakagui. And a lot of times people don't remember. So he made up a song Olioni and Dakagui. Olioni and Dakagui. Anodamawi. Liula damina. Anodamawi. Liula damina. Very easy to remember. Just like counting. Pazo, nis, nasiao. One, two, three, four. We sometimes go to schools. And we'll be telling one of these stories or perhaps singing one of those songs and kids pick it up immediately. We'll walk by a classroom uh, later in the day and hear a bunch of third graders without our being there singing one of those songs that Jesse composed using the Abenaki language as a memory tool, as a powerful way to keep memory alive. One of the things that connects to, uh, to song, of course, is poetry. And uh, it was mentioned that I am the uh, poet laureate of Saratoga Springs. So it is my duty to read to you a couple of my poems, which tie right in to what I've just been saying. The first one is called Pak Holigan. Pak Holigan is our word for the drum. Pak Holigan, hollow object that is struck. Pak Holigan, drum, your voice is the oldest one. The rumble of thunder that brought first rain. The music of life each of us heard before we saw the light of sun or placed our feet upon the earth, hearing that deep felt sound of our mother's heartbeat. Yours is the rhythm all of our steps follow, whether old or young, no matter what tongue we speak or what words we may use to name ourselves, we're always carried by that beat. If we only listen, we will hear you calling, calling us together. And one more poem for you. This is called Pekongan. Pekongan, of course, is the flute. Pekongan, Pekongan, the cedar flute, hollow filled with the flow of breath. Pekongan, gift of the birds, long call of loon, hawks high cry. Pekongan, bright threads stretched from one heart to another, sweet courting sigh. Pekongan, music beyond words from the place where songs begin. I think that it's important for us to see song not as something someone else does, and also not to see song as only for specialists. There is uh, the lyric of a popular song from a few decades ago. It's the singer, not the song. I could not disagree more. The singer is part of the song, but the singer is guided by the song. The song exists beyond and past any singer, if that song is true. And so it is that our songs and our stories remember. And I pass these words on to you. I think I'll pause right now and see if there are any questions, because a question often leads to a story, and a story can take a while to tell. So uh, let's turn it over to the audience now and see what you have to say and what you'd like to ask me. Remembering that... Um, I know a little, but I don't know it all. And you can't even say I know a lot, but sometimes a little is more than others might have on their hands. So over to you. Okay, so 
I'm going to remove Joe as the spotlight so that I can see more people. So if you have your hand up in your camera, um, I'll be able to see you. You can also use the hand raising feature in Zoom, or you can put a comment or a question for Joe in the chat box. Well, you'll need to be. Thank you, Water. Uh, S. Papano, I can't tell if that was you having a hand up or if you're just waving to say hi. But you can unmute if you have a question. I was just saying hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Actually, when I hear the name Papano, it reminds me of um, my dear friend, De Wasenta, Alice Papano, who was the head clan mother of the Eel clan at Onondaga. And Alice is one of the people who told me that we must always give thanks. We must sing or speak our thanks for all the things around us. And I just remembered that. I was just drinking water. She said, Joseph, when you drink water, always thank you to the water. Because without that water, we would not be able to live. And water, too, sings to us. We heard the music of the brooks. We heard the music of the birds. We heard the music of the wolves singing to each other. And it is said among the Haudenosaunee that human beings were the last ones to be given song. Everything else in creation had song. And until we learned to listen properly, we did not have those songs. Thank you for that. Well, everyone in the audience is thinking about um, some questions or comments they might have for you, Joe. I am going to share once again um, the link that you asked me to share, Joe, with everybody. So mm -hmm. it's going to come in as three separate messages in the chat box. So that first link right there is joebrewhack.com s slash the poetry of pop one. So Joe, what is that link about? It's about one thing that I did began uh, doing back in the 1960s, and that is writing about the poetry of popular music and the way in which music is a very significant part of culture and links us together. So in fact, uh, uh, we've been re, re, uh, sort of re-releasing -re some of those essays I wrote on my website, joebruchek.com, and I tie it in with other cultural connections, which are, uh, I think, often not evident to people. They don't recognize that indigeneity is not just limited to indigenous people and that we all need human beings to become more indigenous, to become more of the place, more of saving and containing and taking care of the place as well as each other. Do not forget the message of the wolves. When they sing together, their voices become stronger as they join together. And the wolves taught us to sing together. They taught us to care for our young, that everyone in that wolf pack is responsible for every cub. These are lessons that human beings are constantly forgetting. All you need to do is uh, uh, listen to some of the political campaigns going on these days. And you realize just how much that lesson is, is lost on far too many human beings. That's a really powerful message for everyone here, Joe. So in your own words, how would you define the word indigenous? Yeah, I think that indigenous is a good word. The thing is, people still use the word Indian, even though it's a result of a misunderstanding that's been used for so long. It's in the Constitution. It's in popular native culture. Indigenous people on this continent constantly refer, refer, refer to themselves as being Indian and make jokes about it as well. But that idea of one of my friends, uh, Orrin Lyons, who was an elder of the Onondaga Nation, said, thank goodness. They didn't think they were trying to find Turkey. <laughs> you didn't think about that one. <laughs> By the way, humor is a huge part of people who are truly in touch with their culture, truly in touch with the land and with family. Because if we take ourselves too seriously, it usually means we're out of touch with those things. It means that we think we are the be all and end all individually and that um, everything else sort of is superfluous to our own particular pleasure at our own particular place. And I think that is a, a huge mistake to make. And it's often used, in fact, um, we are going through a new period of genocide where people are literally trying to wipe out other people who are standing up and claiming and, 
recognizing their identity as indigenous. By indigenous, I mean by blood, by family, by land, by culture, all those things define us as indigenous people, whether they're just, um, you know, a genealogy or a, a DNA test, which means nothing. And that idea that all of us are linked together is something that we need to recognize at the same time that every individual is different and every culture is different and needs to be listened to and needs to be respected. Thank you. Now, I see a hand up, uh, Mark Lombard. Yes, uh, thanks, Joe, so much uh, for what you're offering. Uh, I was just, I just finished yesterday a book, um, um, and now I'm going to forget the name of it. Um, in any case, I, I share a connection to Syracuse, not only the university, which I noted uh, you have a connection to, uh, right. but as a but as a native of Syracuse, and mm -hmm. growing up, there was a great deal shared about about Syracuse being um, uh, being the place of the Onondaga. Mm -hmm. um, yes, but there was a sense that while there while the Onondaga were a part of the the larger Iroquois nation, there was this sense that there was a division between um, between indigenous peoples, and mm -hmm. and not so much of the connection. Uh, uh, and I guess I wanted to talk something or hear you talk about what's mm -hmm. the balance of that that we should understand better maybe have a better understanding of and mm -hmm. then the name of the book by the way was on savage shores sure thing I, I have that book actually and you know which talked about not not europeans going to the savage no, but shores, native people but going native to people Europe. coming to what they saw as more yeah. savage which was Absolutely. which was the european theater uh, just yeah. a tremendous book but it did also wrestle with that issue of the you know where there was those uh sorts of um competitions but mm -hmm. also connections between indigenous yeah. peoples okay well let me and i don't know a, if you have a perspective on them but I i'll give you a, a quick a quick rundown because this could take days to talk about quite frankly but to begin with there are many different indigenous nations in north america and they did not always all get along there is history, for example, of migration. So the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois people, migrated into the Northeast and their cousins, the Cherokee, migrated into the Southeast and established themselves in the center of nations that were already there, Algonquin speaking nations. Often this caused conflict, but more often than not, people would settle in to relationships with each other and trade was a big part of that. So understand that to begin with. No one nation's story is the same as another nation's story. And quite frankly, today, I think we need to recognize that no indigenous nation has the right to tell people in another indigenous nation whether they are legitimate or doing the right thing. We need to respect those boundaries, which is traditional and understood. Also traditional and understood was the fact that there was adoption very frequently when there was warfare between Algonquin and Haudenosaunee people, if someone was taken captive, they could be adopted and made a full member of that society to the point where they no longer considered themselves to be Algonquin or Haudenosaunee, but their identity had switched. They had a new name, they had families. And there's a very funny story to me. <laughs> a lot of Europeans were adopted that way. There's a long history of that. In fact, uh, in most of our native nations, we have some indigenous and some native ancestry, and we have some European ancestry because of that process of adoption and intermarriage that took place. In fact, often uh, my friend Tom Porter, who was an elder of the Mohawk nation, the Ganyanke Kaha, the people of the Flint or the Stone, uh, Tom had to marry someone who was Choctaw because <laughs> in his community, you could not marry someone who was from your clan. There are only three clans among the Mohawk, turtle, wolf, and bear. So he couldn't marry anyone from his clan. Secondly, and by the way, his bear clan. Secondly, he could not marry anyone who was a cousin 
first, second, or third cousin. And it eliminated virtually every young woman who could possibly be a, a bill. So he, he had to go all the way down south to find his wife, who was Choctaw. And he said it was meant to be. They were supposed to be together. So you see, often our cultures were made in such a way that they were exo. They would draw people from outside within the culture. So it wasn't inbred. It wasn't just always marrying within the same small circle, which is very helpful. The second thing, and again, this is a big generalization, but the Europeans introduced a number of things to North America that were devastating. Of course, diseases. That was terribly devastating. And of course, warfare. The French and the English brought a world war to North America. And many of our Avenaki people ended up as allies of the French, while others like the Haudenosaunee ended up as allies of the British. And that caused great division and conflict between us, which some people remember to this day. But in general, in general, I would say that there is an understanding that we all share certain values. And there are many things within our cultures that cross from one culture to the other. So that said, I would also point out that there were always ways to make peace, that peacemaking was a huge thing among our different native nations. And the idea of using the pipe as a symbol of peace, not as something to be smoked for pleasure, unless you were very old. Elderly people could smoke tobacco, but not young people. It was done sacramentally, a way of having ceremony to bring people together. And again, I am generalizing because it's different from nation to nation. But many of these things are quite similar. So I think if you take a look at the Onondaga nation, the Onondaga are the center of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, a long time ago, over a thousand years ago, those five nations were at warfare with each other. Terrible war, like what's going on in the Middle East. And the creator just said, sent a peacemaker who brought peace to them by speaking of the importance of peace, by telling stories about peace. And then they planted a ceremonial tree at Onondaga, a great pine tree. And it was a tree with four white roots that stretched through all the directions. You could come and be in the shelter of that tree and live together in peace. Ideas of American democracy come in large part from indigenous roots. Algonquin traditions, the New England town meeting is a direct steal from Algonquin traditions. And the idea of the uh, 50 senators, there were 50 representatives of the League of Haudenosaunee. There were two houses on either side. There was Onondaga where they met. And that idea that everybody would have a voice and would speak was very important. Uh, a number of my... Uh, Haudenosaunee friends, my friend Rick Hill, who is a, a really wonderful guy and a member of the uh, Tuscarora Nation. Uh, Rick told me that uh, there were two big mistakes that the Americans made when they adopted their constitution. They forgot important things that were part of the League of the Haudenosaunee. One, the women have no voice in the American constitution when it was written. It was all men. It was all men. Women did not have a vote. They did not have anything to say. And among the Haudenosaunee, the women always choose the leaders. And the women are the heads of the family, the ones who control the land, and the ones whose clan is passed down from mother to daughter or son, not from the father. The second thing that they forgot or got wrong in the Constitution was slavery. How could you say that a human being is like three quarters or four fifths of a human being? <laughs> that idea that you could have slaves, that they weren't really fully people. Um, my Haudenosaunee friends to this day shake their heads at the illogic of that particular structure. So uh, I've gone a bit far afield, but the point is that there was and there remains uh, a great variety of families and cultures and traditions among our indigenous people of this continent, languages as well. But there was always a lot of borrowing and back and forth between us. In fact, um, this was a uh, something I heard, I've heard said by various, various different elders that um, if you look at the songs and the dances we have among the Haudenosaunee, I'll just continue talking about them. They have something called the alligator dance. There ain't no alligators wild in New York City or New York State, even they, they say they're in the sewers. There were no alligators. Where did it come from? Probably from the people of the South. It was a good song, a good dance, and so it was taken and it was adopted, it became theirs. And that connection was, was really important. One funny story about, about song and dance is when I, was in, uh, when I was in Alaska about 1983, I was at a big festival 
my friend Nora Dauenhauer, who uh, was a wonderful Clinket elder, was with me. And there were different native groups from different, like Shimshan and, and uh, Clinket and so on, who were performing as they did this parade down the street. And I was standing with all these Clinkets, and all of a sudden, along came a float with all these Shimshan people on it. And they were uh, singing and dancing this song with great vigor. And every Clinket became quiet and didn't say a word. I looked over at Nora. I said, okay, what's the deal? She said, well, we sometimes have these contests with each other. And if one nation of our people here wins the contest, they get to keep the song. She said, that used to be a Clinket song, but now it's theirs. And we can't sing it anymore because it has gone to live with them. She said, it's gone to live with them. Like an adopted person, it has gone to live with them. I, I could keep going far too long, so I'll just leave it at that. And by the way, Indigenous Continent is another good book for people to look at, as well as 1491 and 1493, which talk about the Columbian Exchange. Uh, I think that those books, as well as Savage Shores, are good to look at. And I saw mention a book of my sister Marge's, which is called Savage Kin, which is a book about the relationship between uh, anthropologists or ethnologists and native people here in the Northeast. It's quite a book, won an award from the American Anthropological Society. Savage Kin, K-I-N, worth looking at. Thank you, Mark, for that question. Thank you, Joe, for that answer. Joe, I'm going to type the names of those books into the chat box here. Um, so there's Please Savage do. Shores, mm -hmm. uh, Savage Kin, 1491. 1491, 1493, and Indigenous Continent, Indigenous Continent written by a British scholar about the, uh, the native communities and the native cultures of North America. Well done book. And Angie, it was on, on, uh, on, on, Savage, Shores. on Savage Shores. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, while I'm looking for another hand up, um, actually, Joe, there was a comment in the chat box for you from Marguerite Lampman. And she wrote, so much gratitude for the gift of your words and music this afternoon. Thank you. Oh, and I agree. All you need. Thank you, my friend. So those of you who are um, looking in the chat box, you might have noticed that I added in some more links. These are from Joe. So the, the next link, Joe, was important expressions slash phrases in song. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about what, what's in that link? That's part of what Jesse uses to teach the Abenaki language. And uh, the way to remember things is to sing one of these songs. And when he does the uh, uh, full language immersion at Middlebury College this summer, a lot of singing is going to be taking place. And a lot of memory is going to be carried by those songs. And Jesse was supposed to be with us here today. I don't know if you mentioned it to the audience or not, but unfortunately he wasn't able to, to attend. Um, right, we're too popular. He had agreed to be on a panel in Vermont at, at the same exact time at two o'clock. And we look at our schedule and, oh my gosh, this occasionally happens. Um, so we, we try to coordinate as, as good as we can, but sometimes one of us slips up. And uh, fortunately, there's two of us. We've all done it, Joe, don't worry. We're really... <laughs> But you know what? This is just a good excuse for us to maybe get Jesse to come on as a, as another speaker. Absolutely. Next year, yeah. Um, okay. There's another. The next link that you share, you wanted everyone to have. You described it as all the foundational patterns of the Abenaki language in one song. As a musician, yes. his music has been a primary driver in language reclamation, reclamation efforts. Min course song. Right. So take a look at it. That's a YouTube video, correct? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, there is a message in the chat box from Vera Sheehan. She says, Quiet Joe, your lifetime of dedication to the community and educating the public is so greatly appreciated. Thank you, my friend. Nidoba. My other person, my other self. <laughs> And there's another message in the chat. Oh, that one's just to me seen. They're not seeing the links in the chat. So I'm going to send the links in the chat again, everybody. Um, so the first one 
I'm going to send. Uh, Joe, can you tell us more about this link? It's by Rajin Obamsawin, a spiritual Rajan leader. Obamsawin. Rajan yeah. Obamsawin is one of the people in the community of Odenak in Canada who has been extremely important in keeping the songs and the dances and the traditions alive. Uh, Jeannie Brink, whom I mentioned, regards him as a mentor, and so do many other people. And I have uh, the deepest respect for Rajan and his teachings. And I always think it's important that when we learn something from someone, we don't forget to mention them. I'm always mentioning names, and it's not meant to be name dropping. <laughs> it's just meant to be acknowledgement. I always say that when you learn something that is a tradition from another culture, you have a responsibility to do certain things. One, you need to acknowledge where it comes from. Two, you need to know not just that one thing, but all the background that makes it understandable. For often people misunderstand things because they don't know the full background. And then thirdly, you need permission. You need to have people say to you, it is okay for you to share this. I'll give you an example. About uh, 25 years ago, I was working with Symphony Space in New York City to put together a series of programs uh, called Coyote Walks Around, with traditional stories and songs and dances from around the American continent. And one of them was about the Great Plains. And we had a number of folks from Great Plains tribal nations who were performing. And as the MC, I was supposed to introduce people and maybe tell a story. And one of the men, um, whose name was Albert Whiteman, he was a champion uh, bronc rider among the Northern Cheyenne, told me, I will teach you, Joseph, I will teach you the grass dance song for we are going to do a grass dance, but you must promise me, never sing that song unless there's about to be a grass dance and a grass dancer has asked you to sing it. So I have sung that song three times in my life. <laughs> I've told that story three times in my life, but I can't tell it right now because there's no grass dance going on. <clears throat> so I think that's important for people to recognize and not to think that um, <clears throat> you can just, reach out and take something. That's not the proper way to do it. Always give back more than you get. Thanks, Joe. That's a good reminder for everybody in all contexts. Uh, there's another message in the chat for you. It's from Don, Liana, and Willard Peabody. Now, I don't know if Don, Liana, or Willard would like to uh, unmute and and say it out loud, or if there's another Abenaki speaker here, maybe Pat, Holly, or Vera might be willing to jump in. To I'm happy to unmute and say hi. Kwai kwai, Joseph. Kwai uh, kwai. Chat was Liwalal Damana La Jesse Kwai kwai. Oh, Liwalal Damana. Thank you so much for that. Another message in the chat for you, Joe, is from Betsy Thayer. She said, thank you so much to Joe and today's organizers. I'm so appreciative of the chance to learn more about Abenaki and other indigenous cultures. Okay, if you have a question, please uh, either put it in the chat box or wave your hand in front of your computer screen. Mark, go ahead. Just, uh, Joe, I noticed on your connected to the piece you had done, speaking some about uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, I did yeah. notice that there was a place for contact. If we have other questions about culture, would you mind if we dropped you a line sure. to ask those that you, you know, when you have a chance to get to them? Absolutely. I've got a, a feature in my joebruchak.com website where you can ask me questions. In fact, I got one today, which I was kind of amused and pleased by. My dad was a professional taxidermist. And someone actually uh, wrote me a, a note saying they had a deer head my dad mounted in 1975, and they wondered if I'd like to see pictures of it. And I said, you bet. <laughs> actually, 1956, excuse me, 1956. So I love the fact that the world can be connected together in this way and that we can use it in a positive way. There's far too much negativity on the Internet and on various uh, sites that you can find. But I think if we use it as a way to enlarge our conversation and to share with each other and to ask questions, if we have a question, and I will always try to give an answer 
or at least say I don't know if that's the case. Thanks for that question, Mark. Thanks for answering that, Joe. Okay, everyone, we have our last question. Um, and before I read it out loud, I am going to share my screen one more time. Um, and this is mostly for the purpose of recording this program. So all the <clears throat> people who are not live with us who are watching this later can see all of those links that I shared in the chat box. So I'm going to uh, leave that up for a minute while I uh, find that question in the chat box. I'm not sure I can find the chat box while I'm sharing my screen. So if you're watching this as a recording and you want to type up those uh, links, go ahead and hit pause on the YouTube video right now so that you can keep those. Or take a picture with your phone. <laughs> yeah, that's another way. So um, this last question of the afternoon is from Carol Fournier. And Joe, she says, thank you for this engaging and deep learning talk. Can you speak to the indigenous communities in the Adirondack region and history, as well as the stories of the Adirondack region? Thank you. Yes, actually. Okay. Yet another book. Rural Indigenousness, which is by uh, Melissa Otis, and it's about the indigenous communities of the Adirondacks, and it's a really good book. I, I don't know anything else like this, so I recommend this book, and uh, I actually write a lot. I've got more that's going to be coming out about the history of our people in the Adirondack region and Saratoga region. If you take a look at joebruchak.com, you'll find a few things, but I would recommend this book of Melissa's. Uh, we had her at our, our Dakinai Education Center when the book came out and she did a superb program. So um, the Iroquois and Algonquian people of the Adirondacks, rural indigenousness. Thank you, Joe. And if you didn't already catch that, I did type that into the chat box really quickly um, so that you can look in there too if you need to see a visual. Okay. So thank you everyone for attending this program. I do really quickly want to announce that our April lecture <clears throat> will be in person. So we're going back to in person at the museum on April 21st. And again, that's for the history of Masons in Vermont um, with Rob Grandchamp as our speaker. Um, but before we all sign off, can you please give a quick thank you to our presenter today? Thank you so much to Joe. Very good. I'm seeing lots of applause in the videos. And Joe, you, a friend. lot of positive messages in the chat box that are coming in as well from Hi many to all the people I know, even you share. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Awesome. Oh, Joe, okay, nice Joe, is there any last message you'd like to leave us with for the afternoon? Well, what we say uh, to people as we're parting is, which means have a good journey. But I would also add, may you sleep well, may you dream well. Thank you very much for those blessings, Joe. Thank you, everyone, for attending this program. And I hope to see you at some of our upcoming events as well. Have a great day. Thanks, Angie. Thank you, Joe. Angie, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Joe, I don't know if you can see the chat box. I can read out some of the messages for you if you like. Yeah, would you do that? I don't see sure. it right now. Absolutely. Diana <clears throat> Wood said, thank you, Joe. You're an amazing storyteller, and I always enjoy learning from you. Uh, Vera wrote, looking forward to seeing you on April 4th, remembering the Dawnland. Mark Osborne said, thank you so much for sharing, Joe. Carol Fournier said, thank you, Joe. Nancy Ravenel said, Kichi Willie Ni, Joe. Mm -hmm. Am I close in the pronunciation? Kichi Willie Ni, yeah, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> uh, Judy Thomas says, thank you so much for sharing your culture, Joe. I appreciate you and your sharing with all of us. Al Bellucci said, thank you for this awesome sharing. Don Liana and Willard Peabody um, said, Kachi 
Will Nui. Is he really Nui? Yeah. Uh, and then they said, "Geesh, they gotta get their spell check to learn Abenaki." Pakuno Guizian, Peabody, you appear new to me. Pakuno Guizian, you know back. So I know that uh, there's some people who might still be logged in because they may have just stepped away and maybe not realized program's ending. But if there's anybody who's um, still on the program right now and had a specific question, feel free to unmute and jump in. Thanks for that nice intro, Glenn. I appreciated that. You're welcome. You deserve it. And thank you for putting up with us. <laughs> <laughs> you were really good at it, Glenn. It's good to see you again. Thank oh, you. Yeah. yeah. And and thank thank you, Angie and Joseph and and uh I don't know if Vera had anything to do with this broadcast or not, but I really appreciated it. it always. And I can't say it in the language my kids can. Uh -huh. Jesse's taught that. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> well, it's our pleasure. Thanks for attending. And Joe, one last message in the chat box from S. Papineau. So thank you so much. So happy I found this. Great. Great. Okay. Well, thank with you. that, awesome. I think I'm going to have us all log off and enjoy okay. the rest of Sunday. Good see you, Uliuni. See you, Uliuni.